This is section 20 of Mark Twain's Speeches by Mark Twain, read by John Greenman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dress Reform and Copyright by Mark Twain, read by John Greenman. When the present copyright law was under discussion, Mr. Clemens appeared before the committee. He had sent Speaker Cannon the following letter. Dear Uncle Joseph, please get me the thanks of Congress, not next week, but right away. It is very necessary. Do accomplish this for your affectionate old friend right away, by persuasion if you can, by violence if you must, for it is imperatively necessary that I get on the floor of the House for two or three hours and talk to the members, man by man, in behalf of support, encouragement, and protection of one of the nation's most valuable assets and industries, its literature. I have arguments with me. Also, a barrel with liquid in it. Give me a chance. Get me the thanks of Congress. Don't wait for others. There isn't time. Furnish them to me yourself, and let Congress ratify later. I have stayed away and let Congress alone for seventy-one years, and am entitled to the thanks. Congress knows this perfectly well, and I have long felt hurt that this quite proper and earned expression of gratitude has been merely felt by the House, and never publicly uttered. Send me an order on the sergeant-at-arms quick. When shall I come? With love and a benediction, Mark Twain. While waiting to appear before the committee, Mr. Clemens talked to the reporters. Why don't you ask me why I am wearing such apparently unseasonable clothes? Well, I'll tell you. I have found that when a man reaches the advanced age of seventy-one years, as I have, the continual sight of dark clothing is likely to have a depressing effect upon him. Light-colored clothing is more pleasing to the eye and enlivens the spirit. Now, of course, I cannot compel everyone to wear such clothing just for my especial benefit, so I do the next best thing, and wear it myself. Of course, before a man reaches my years, the fear of criticism might prevent him from indulging his fancy. I am not afraid of that. I am decidedly for pleasing color combinations in dress. I like to see the women's clothes, say, at the opera. What can be more depressing than the somber black which custom requires men to wear upon state occasions? A group of men in evening clothes looks like a flock of crows, and is just about as inspiring. After all, what is the purpose of clothing? Are not clothes intended primarily to preserve dignity and also to afford comfort to their wearer? Now I know of nothing more uncomfortable than the present-day clothes of men. The finest clothing made is a person's own skin, but of course society demands something more than this. The best-dressed man I have ever seen, however, was a native of the Sandwich Islands who attracted my attention thirty years ago. Now, when that man wanted to don a special dress to honor a public occasion or a holiday, why, he occasionally put on a pair of spectacles. Otherwise, the clothing with which God had provided him sufficed. Of course, I have ideas of dress reform. For one thing, why not adopt some of the women's styles? Goodness knows they adopt enough of ours— Take the peekaboo waist, for instance. It has the obvious advantage of being cool and comfortable, and in addition it is almost always made up in pleasing colors which cheer and do not depress. It is true that I dress the Connecticut Yankee at King Arthur's court in a plug hat, but, let's see, that was twenty-five years ago. Then no man was considered fully dressed until he donned a plug hat. Nowadays I think that no man is dressed until he leaves it home. Why, when I left home yesterday, they trotted out a plug hat for me to wear. 
you must wear it they told me why just think of going to washington without a plug hat but i said no i would wear a derby or nothing why i believe i could walk along the streets of new york i never do but still i think i could and i should never see a well-dressed man wearing a plug hat if i did i should suspect him of something i don't know just what but i would suspect him why when i got up on the second story of that pennsylvania ferry-boat coming down here yesterday i saw howells coming along he was the only man on the boat with a plug hat and i tell you he felt ashamed of himself he said he had been persuaded to wear it against his better sense but just think of a man nearly seventy years old who has not a mind of his own on such matters are you doing any work now the youngest and most serious reporter asked work i retired from work on my seventieth birthday since then i have been putting in merely twenty-six hours a day dictating my autobiography which as john phoenix said in regard to his autograph may be relied upon as authentic as it is written exclusively by me but it is not to be published in full until i am thoroughly dead i have made it as caustic fiendish and devilish as possible it will fill many volumes and i shall continue writing it until the time comes for me to join the angels it is going to be a terrible autobiography it will make the hair of some folks curl but it cannot be published until i am dead and the persons mentioned in it and their children and grandchildren are dead it is something awful can you tell us the names of some of the notables that are here to see you off i don't know i am so shy my shyness takes a peculiar phase i never look a person in the face the reason is that i am afraid they may know me and that i may not know them which makes it very embarrassing for both of us i always wait for the other person to speak i know lots of people but i don't know who they are it is all a matter of ability to observe things i never observe anything now i gave up the habit years ago you should keep a habit up if you want to become proficient in it for instance i was a pilot once but i gave it up and i do not believe the captain of the minneapolis would let me navigate his ship to london still if i think that he is not on the job i may go up on the bridge and offer him a few suggestions end of dress reform and copyright by mark twain read by john greenman